Welcome everybody to the IES webinar Crossrail Environmental Lessons Learned, which will be presented by Rob Paris. Rob has been the head of sustainability and consents at Crossrail for the past nine years. And after 13 years working in environmental and sustainability consulting, Rob joined Crossrail in 2003 as part of the team responsible for delivering the environmental statement. After the submission of the environmental statement, he then became responsible for the production of further volumes for negotiating several key elements of the Crossrail environmental minimum requirements. And he was also the co-author of the Crossrail sustainability strategy. Today, Rob will review the significant environmental impacts and challenges identified in the environmental statement submitted as part of the authorization process trace some of the outcomes through the delivery phase and discuss lessons learned in doing so. And so thank you very much for logging in and Rob, over to you. Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you for that introduction. So the first thing I should really do is just give you a broad introduction to Crossrail itself. I shouldn't assume that everyone knows what Crossrail is or you may have heard of it, but you don't know any further details. So. You could spend a webinar in itself describing Crossrail, and I'm going to do it in this one slide. It, essentially, it's a new train service, a metro-style stopping service, so it's not a new tube line, which often is, is thought. It's 118 kilometres long, uh, starting at Reading and Heathrow in the west, coming through on an existing rail line to central London. It then goes into a tunnelled section and splits, going up to Shenfield on the northeast and Abbey Wood on the southeast. The central section shown here in red is in tunnel. It's 21 kilometers of Twinbore tunnel, that's 42 kilometers in total. And the stations are subsurface stations um, by and large. Crossrail Limited and its contractors are responsible for delivering the central section. And our partner Network Rail and their contractors are responsible for delivering on the surface works. It's principally a publicly funded project and the two sponsors are Transport for London and the Department for Transport. Um, and when Crossrail opens, it will add at a stroke 10% new capacity to the rail network, um, improving journey times and helping to regenerate areas of London and grow the London economy. If I'm gonna talk about the environmental impacts, I need to talk a little bit about the authorization process. Um, the powers and deemed planning permission to build Crossrail come from an Act of Parliament, which is the Crossrail Act 2008. And similar processes in the past were done for the Channel Tunnel and for what was called the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, now known as High Speed One. Um, some of you may be more familiar with things like development control orders and Transport and Works Act orders. Um, it works very much on the same principle. Basically, a bill is put together, which is the Draft Act, and various documents accompany that and it's deposited into what's known as the parliamentary process, which is a couple of select committees in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And with that bill, one of the documents that's submitted is the environmental statement. Um, key context to this webinar is that then during that parliamentary process, there's a, a series of negotiations that takes place with the local authorities and the statutory agencies. By that, I mean, for example, um, Environment Agency and Natural England. And they produce a suite of documents known as the Crossrail Environmental Minimum Requirements or EMR. And if you hear me say EMR later, which I'm sure you will, that's what I'm talking about. And for the purposes of this webinar, the key documents in the EMR to be mindful of are something called the Environmental Memorandum and the Crossrail Construction Code. The Environmental Memorandum basically is a document that defines how we will design and manage Crossrail uh, to uh, reduce and control environmental impacts. Then the construction code, that took all of the environmental mitigation assumed for the environmental statement and, and incorporated it. It then looked at the local authorities' environmental management plans and incorporated those. And it looked at what was then the key major projects of the time, which were Thameslink, High Speed One, Heathrow Terminal Five, and incorporated the practice from there. So that created what's the, if you like, in a way, the, the environmental management plan for construction of Crossrail. And it was the best practice of all of that at the time. So it's fair to say that the environmental minimum requirement of Crossrail at that stage was actually best practice. And 
the way it was set up was that any any organization that then delivered Crossrail, and that turned out to be us, Crossrail Limited, as, as, the, as the key body working with partners, um, was contractually bound to comply with the environmental minimum requirements. And what that did it very neatly is that it meant that the mitigation assumed for the environmental statement had to be then flowed down into the project. Okay, so let's have a quick look then at um, at, at the significant impacts that were predicted. It, it probably wouldn't come as a surprise, I would hope, that um, all of the significant adverse impacts were really during the construction phase. Operational, much less so, in fact, you were really looking at significant beneficial impacts from the, from the transport um, improvements that, that accompanied the scheme. So the significant adverse impacts from construction, um, in no particular order, so there was an ecological impact. These days people tend to talk about biodiversity, but it, back then, um, if you consider that we, um, we set out on the process in 2005, it was all about ecological impacts. So um, chiefly by working on those surface sections, the Great Western and Great Eastern Main Lines, there were areas of green corridor along those lines where construction would remove them. And that was by cumulative loss considered to be a significant impact. Then throughout the environmental statement, everywhere there was a construction site, essentially the visual amenity impact of a construction site in itself was deemed a significant impact. So we had an awful lot of those. And then noise and vibration, light visual amenity, we had a lot of significant impacts associated with noise and vibration. You can see there over 2000 properties um, were deemed to likely experience a significant impact. And then at a few locations, chiefly in central London, you're looking at here, um, there were some significant impacts to do with traffic and transport movement, um, chiefly around a mixture of road closures, diversions to do utilities, buses diverted, um, additional loading on the road with lorry traffic and, and so forth. So broadly speaking, those were the, the, the main significant impacts um, that, we, that we were looking at. And then there were these, which were environmental challenges. They, these were big challenges. They weren't significant impacts in their own right, but, but they represented something that was um, major and had to be dealt with. So if you're going to bore all those tunnels and create all those subsurface stations, then you're going to produce a lot of surplus material, what we called excavated material. And at the time, we were looking at 7 million cubes of that. And you had to find a way to dispose of that. Um, at the time, we, we developed, well, we had to demonstrate that, that there was a feasible means of doing that. And so we looked at all the landfill sites that, that were around um, in, in the locale, if you like, of the southeast of London, and that we, we worked out that you could take our excavated material and it could be used usefully for cell construction and capping material. Um, and that would be a means by which we could deal with that. And I'll, and I'll come to what we actually did with that in the end later. We were faced with the largest archaeological program ever undertaken at the time. That's been well overtaken now, I think, by HS2, High Speed 2. Um, but again, we were faced with doing that, and we needed to do that archaeological work and, and not compromise the program as best we could. In terms of carbon, we the environmental statement contained um, a carbon footprint. There was theoretically a payback period on the construction carbon because the, the new crossrail services would be replacing some old diesel services and older electric train services. But it wasn't a great payback period. Um, so there was a challenge there to see what we could do in terms of improving on our carbon footprint. And then not surprisingly, uh, building something the size of crossrail uses a lot of resource. Primarily, you're talking concrete and steel, by far and away, lots of concrete and steel. That has an impact in itself. It has to be sourced from somewhere and it needs to be transported. So again, um, these were all significant challenges then that we had to deal with. Final bit of um, context for you. All of that challenge was then set against another challenge of complexity. Uh, this isn't meant to be read, you'll be happy to know. It's a schematic though of all the contracts that were necessary to deliver just the central sections. I'm not talking the surface sections that Network Rail did, but just our, our sections. And you can see from the schematic, the tunnel drives essentially running across the middle there. And then you'll see stacks of, of contracts running down from there, which were all different contracts working at, at, a, at a single location. And then in the bottom right, you'll see some yellow ones. These are what we called route-wide contracts. And these were ones that we procured centrally 
and then they were they were sort of diverted out onto all the different sites as needed. So to give you an example of one of those, um, the noise insulation contract. So um, we had to put noise insulation into certain locations, and we directly had specialists that went out no matter what the site was, and they would they would deliver on that. And this one. Sometimes people find it easier to, to conceive than the previous one, um, quite often not. But if I just take you very quickly through it, what this again is essentially showing the same thing. In the left hand side, you've got the design contracts. Next in, you've got the enabling works contracts, that's utility diversions and demolitions and those sorts of works. And then you've got the main works contracts following that um, and system and route wide contracts. And to give you just one example, at Liverpool Street, we had one design contract six enabling work contracts and four main works contracts all delivering the one station so the environmental performance of crossrail and the management of the environmental impact was across this complexity and it was only through the coordination and management of all of that that, that we had a chance of getting the outcomes that we needed so i'll start with resource management and focus on that excavated material story now the emr as a document was written it simply required that we apply the waste hierarchy to um, reduce, reuse, recycle, and then, and then dispose um, as, as best practicable. Um, so when it came to actually delivering on that, we needed to really set some targets um, about what it is we were going to do. And we worked with RAP, the uh, Waste Resources Action Programme, to deliver those targets. And, and working with them for excavated material, we came up with a base target that 95% would go to beneficial reuse and a stretch target that 100% would go for beneficial reuse. Now in the outturn, you'll, you'll see the number there, we actually achieved 99.7% of the excavated material went to beneficial reuse, which, which was an excellent outcome. And, and that, that slight remainder, the bit that didn't, was, was essentially contaminated material, which by and large, you couldn't do anything other with than, than, than take it to landfill in, in the normal way. Um, and in the, in the bottom left there, you'll see that those were our top 10 sites where excavated material did go to in, in terms of the total amount over the top 10. Um, and they all went to reuse like new nature reserves and development platforms and, and, and things like, like that. And the key story perhaps of, of the excavated material was, was this one. I can't go without talking about Wallasey Island. So this was a project from the RSPB uh, done, done jointly with the Environment Agency as well, but the RSPB was managing the project. And the island, as you see it in the top left, was what they'd acquired. And it had been used for intensive agricultural use. Um, and it was uh, a, a failing seawall, and it was going to essentially be affected by climate change and, and disappear. So they, they were taking a new approach, which was to, to do um, soft management um, and allow new habitat and allow some of the water in and, and maintain habitat and keep the island that way as a nature reserve. And they needed material to do that. So we entered into an agreement with them to provide them um, in the end with just over 3 million tonnes of excavated material to create an area known as Jubilee Marsh. And, and we set up shipping and a, and, a, and a jetty and we took the material over there. And that was the single largest recipient of the excavated material of Crossrail. And the bottom right, you can see the outcome. Now, they face in different orientations, but you can essentially see the new area of wetland and marsh lagoons that were created in, in, in the top end there, and new habitat also that we, that we actually spread down to the design that the RSPB wanted. And that was a, a really terrific outcome. And we essentially opened that as a reserve, and the water was let in in 2015. And when a survey was done in 2017, out of approximately 12,000 species in total on the island, about 9,500 were in Jubilee Marsh. And that was out of, say, 36 species, about 29 of those were in Jubilee Marsh. So even after just two years, it was making a significant contribution to the biodiversity of that reserve. And as that habitat will mature, which it absolutely will, um, that should only get better. I mentioned resource use um, in, my, in one of the earlier slides, so I'll pick up on that here as well. So like with waste, one of the main things that you do is run programs to, to design to reduce a waste, but also resource use. That's what you would seek to do. But working with RAP as well, we also set um, a, a target for um, recycled and reused material in, in, um, in new material by value. And um, the target we set with them was 15% uh, and a stretch target of 20. And you'll see there in the middle top that at the outturn of that, um, we achieved 39. But it, it should be qualified that when you consider that the vast bulk of material was steel and concrete, those materials do 
uh, lend themselves in particular to achieving th those kind of outcomes. But it wasn't known at the time that was that was learning after the event. And in addition to that, uh, one of the challenges around resource use is what we called ethical sourcing or responsible procurement, because the last thing you want, and no matter who you are, but particularly on a publicly um, funded project, is to find that modern slavery has entered your supply chain and that things are being sourced from a quarry somewhere in the world where child, child labour is employed. So we set up a programme with our contractors to assess the risks to the key materials that, that would construct Crossrail, like steel, like concrete and stone. And we identified various certification schemes that would help provide assurance that that, um, that wouldn't happen. And we also developed some tools around audits and competencies whereby they could go in and, and visit sites and inspect them if, if, if you didn't have certification schemes that, that enabled you to do that. And that work proved to be invaluable. Just to give you just one very simple example, it was around 2015. Um, and some of you may remember, but Tata Steel announced that it was going to make 1,200 redundancies at the Scunthorpe plant. And um, during Prime Minister's questions, the then new leader of the opposition was Jeremy Corbyn, and he challenged um, David Cameron as to, as to what the government was doing in terms of supporting the steel industry. And amongst his reply was, was he said that all the steel on Crossrail was sourced from UK sources. Um, and no sooner had he said that, and you could have said, he said what? Uh, then the phones began to ring back at our place. Um, and there were all sorts of journalists trying to find out if, if this was indeed the truth. And it broadly was. I mean, clearly the ore wasn't all dug up in the UK and processed there, but still by the fact that most of it is recycled as it moves around. And it had been sourced in the UK by a recycling plant, um, primarily Celsa steel in, in Cardiff. So we were able to, to actually support that. So there's all sorts of reasons, absolutely sound and valid reasons why you would make sure that ethical sourcing was part of your supply chain. But if you are a big major project or even a small player, one day your reputation could depend upon it, um, and ours almost did. Archaeology then. Um, so yes, we must have unearthed about 10,000 artefacts spanning 55 million years from about 20 sites across London. Uh, that includes things like Isambard Kingdom Brunel's old steam shed just west of Paddington. There were 3,000 skeletons from the Bedlam burial site unearthed at Liverpool Street. And um, for, um, for those of you West Ham fans, um, the remains of the Thames Iron Works out at Limo Peninsula and, and many other things besides. So all of that needed to be done and protect the programme. And the way that we did that was, uh, remember those route-wide contracts I mentioned to you earlier? So we procured the archaeology as a central route-wide contract. And then for, for our main works contracts, which I will call tier ones, for in our tier one contracts, they were required by that contract to work with and coordinate with the archaeology contractors. And so that meant that they took possession of the site. And the moment they cleared the, the site in order to, to get to the, the base ground, the archaeologists were then deployed in and they could rapidly get on with their work. And all of that was done without delay to the program, which, which everyone was extremely extremely proud of. So the archaeology challenge went extremely well. So carbon. Um, yes, we did a carbon footprint for the environmental statement and we updated that. Now, given that Crossrail has a 120 year design life, it probably doesn't come as a great surprise when you look at the pie chart in the top left that the majority of the, of the carbon footprint is from the operation of Crossrail and, and the remainder would be down to construction and the embodied energy and um, embodied carbon during construction. So we, we looked at what we could influence um, and on the operational side, we could, we could influence the first generation of rolling stock. And um, that would typically last about 30 to 35 years before it's replaced. So we set a, a, a train weight target of 350 tonnes maximum for a 200 metre train and uh, 24 kilowatt hours um, for the uh, energy efficiency um, per train. And Bombardier actually won that, that particular contract for, for the construction of the depot and, and the rolling stock. And they brought their aerospace industry um, experience to play and they actually smashed that rate target coming in at 319 tonnes. And from the testing and commissioning we've done, it looks like the energy efficiencies of those trains are about 15, uh, 14 kilowatt hours per train which was um, an absolutely e excellent outcome from, from our perspective from that side. On the construction side, it was more difficult. Now, the EMR was largely quiet on, on, on carbon at all. And we wanted to set targets, and there was we, 
reached out to the industry and there was really nothing out there. So in the end, we got our contractors together and we asked them what they thought would be a reasonable construction carbon reduction target. And they came back with a range of about between four and eight percent reduction on a baseline. And being the client, we said, OK, we'll take eight. So, so that was that was what we set out to do. They created baselines and then we um, target was to reduce eight percent off those. And they used things like LED lighting and hybrid equipment and all, the, all these other measures. And the outturn result of, of, of that program was in fact an 18.6% reduction in, in the baseline, over the baseline of, of the carbon emissions. And then what did that all mean in terms of the, um, the payback that I talked about earlier? Well, depending on the assumptions you make, and these always do based on things like future grid mix and all those other stuff. Um, nonetheless, we're looking at a carbon payback of between nine and 13 years, which, which was an excellent outcome. We, we were very pleased um, to, to manage, manage to achieve that. So I mentioned that uh, ecological impact as it was, as it was um, deemed at the time. So um, the, the world moved on, biodiversity became the issue and biodiversity accounting came in whilst we were variously de delivering the scheme. So whilst that hadn't existed before, we thought that was an excellent tool to use. So both we and Network Rail, our partner on the surface sections, we applied um, DEFRA's biodiversity accounting tool to, to what we had. And, and what that basically came up with was that on the central section, overall, we, we were gonna make um, a net loss. I mean, that there wasn't a, a huge amount in that central section to start with, but nonetheless, what we were going to affect there would be a net loss. But we set our target of achieving 80% of the credits that we could. Um, and we're still in the, in the final stages of delivery and then the final stages of putting some of these, these um, schemes in place, but actually we're on target to achieve 94% of the credits that we could. And if you do include Wallace the Island, we're absolutely in, in the plus. Um, but the DEFRA scheme doesn't actually allow for that because it's actually the RSPB scheme. So we can't claim it, but I always mention it because obviously that has made a significant contribution in terms of our, our biodiversity performance. Network Rail, they were very ambitious. They went for a no net loss approach on the surface rail. Uh, again, they're still in the throes of delivering that. Um, but they, they, they assure us that they're still on track. Um, some of that will probably be achieved by um, biodiversity offsetting, contributing to, to other schemes elsewhere, but um, certainly on target to achieve no net loss. So again, in terms of biodiversity, a, a very positive outcome. So I mentioned all those visual impacts. Um, I can tell you now that of all the complaints we received on Crossrail over the course of its delivery, and we've been constructing for eight, nine years now, um, there have been very, very few uh, about the visual impact of a site. Now, that's not to say it's not about the existence of a site. That's a different issue. But but it's visual impact hardly at all. And the only thing that, that ironically was an issue was that we'd agreed with um, the local authorities very early on that all our sites would be surrounded by these plain blue wooden hoardings. And people really didn't like those. So, so the complaints that we did receive very early on was how much people disliked um, the plain blue wooden hoardings. So we looked at that again and we came up with ways of making those more interesting. And you can see um, three examples there. You can see the blue in the top left and you can see the examples of what we did there. And in terms of the comments that we then received, um, it was actually compliments about how interesting and how much people quite liked our hoardings. So um, again, I suppose what I would say was the lesson learned there was that considering the environmental statement was littered with significant visual impacts of construction sites, perhaps the way that that's done could be reanalyzed and reassessed, particularly at least where you're in built up urban areas, cities like London, where construction isn't an unusual occurrence. I'm not saying it would apply everywhere, but in that circumstance, perhaps people could think again about how you do um, environmental impact assessment on, 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 that, on that scale. Now, I put this in to illustrate a, a couple of points. Um, uh, it's, it's all very well giving you the, um, the, the great things that happened, but, but there are the bigger challenges. Now, this is Paddington Station, and you can see our, our work site. It's a long strip basically running up the middle. And then Paddington Station is, is that big building you see on the right. And that's a grade one listed building. So just bear that in mind, and this will come to relevance in, in a moment. And then this is Whitechapel Station, which has a lot of subsurface elements, but quite a lot of surface elements as well. And you can see our site there, it's, it's a kind of cross shaped. 
um, and you can you can see the work there it's, it's slightly running north south and slightly running east west but the thing to draw your attention to here is that the, the strip all along running east west over the top there is residential property and if you look at the the south in the sort of bottom to middle left you can see either side of our construction are two blocks of flats they are also residential property so so we were building at some locations like Whitechapel cheek by jowl where people have been living and we've been doing that for about eight years and it goes without saying that the biggest challenge I would say of all the things that we've been faced by Crossrail has been noise and vibration from construction sites in terms of complaints received it's something like 98 even slightly above approaching 99% of all complaints received have been about construction noise and vibration so it's it's been a biggie and and I and it will be I think for future projects in built up areas in the future and I'll come to that so what did we do about that well the EMR did require that Crossrail and its contractors had to get section 61 consents which are control of construction site noise under the Control of Pollution Act. And that's approval from the local authorities. Now in the normal world, the non-crossrail world, you, you don't have to get section 61 consents, but the EMR required that in the crossrail world, you did. So, so that was the one aspect of what we had to do. But we ran a lot of programs encouraging best practice noise management on site and seeking them to identify innovative ways of doing that. And so the two photos you see on the left there are one example of that. So this is at Paddington. And you'll see in the top there, that's a, a diaphragm wall that was constructed right next to the main building. And the original proposal to break that down, because the top needed to be broken down, would have been to peck it. And the noise and vibration from that was entirely unacceptable, particularly when you've got grade one listed Paddington next door. So they went away, they looked at, and, and they found a pinch with pride from the minerals industry. And they, there's a thing called drill and burst, hydraulic bursting. So they drilled holes into that. And then you, you pump hydraulic in and it bursts it and it breaks out chunks basically quietly. You can then take away those chunks and you can break them somewhere else and break them down where it's not going to impact on people. So that was, that was a lovely example of one particular piece of best practice that was driven by the programs that we ran. Um, there's another example there, the bottom right. Uh, this is at Whitechapel and that was an acoustic shed. So an entire shed was built over the, the, the head house work site for, for one of the locations at Whitechapel. And that proved to be very successful. That's not to say we didn't get a lot of complaints as you probably can imagine from our works at Whitechapel throughout the project. But I would just draw your attention in, in the top left of that one picture with the big gray shed, you'll see the block of flats just poking above the top there. So that's how close we were and those are the sorts of measures that were required. Now, in terms of lessons learned, what would I say around this? Well, I, I recall um, that when we were going through the bill process, there was a lot of comment that when the contractors came on board, the big tier one contractors came on board, they would know all about getting section 61 consents and, and how, how, how great that management would be. But I would say that in practice, it took a lot of them quite a while to get up to speed. And I also know that the Independent Complaints Commissioner for Crossrail, that when he writes his lessons learned, his memoirs, if you will, He's going to question the validity of how much construction and how noisy construction can be in built up urban environments and, and question just how much of that um, you, you can reasonably do in the future, particularly working at night, as we often had to do. So there will be a commercial advantage, I think, to contractors to do what they did with health and safety. You go back to the bad old days and health and safety was about the health and safety manager and no one else. And then it became something that everyone did and performance improved markedly. And I think the same will happen to noise vibration on major projects being delivered in built up urban areas. So that's noise and vibration. Um, I've, I'm, I'm going into time rapidly here, so I'll, I'll speed up a little. Um, I would say again that like visual, in the end, there was not a lots of significant issues and complaints around congestion in London. I think London is used to construction. That's not to say that there weren't times when diversions caused issues, but generally speaking, traffic does find a way. And we did things like we changed the tunneling strategy on the west and that, that helped to mean that excavated material could come out by rail rather than road. And that reduced about 55,000 um, HGV movements as a result of that. So there was, there was a lot of design done in to try and um, break down, if you like, the number of lorry movements we had to have. We operated a traffic control center. There was a lot of advanced planning. And one of the key things we did was, was trying to protect vulnerable road users like pedestrians and in particular cyclists. So in the contract, we required um, 
a, sort of like above and beyond the norm safety equipment to be fitted to all lorries. And we required that all lorry drivers attend a safety training course. And 10,000 lorry drivers went through that course, which also included an energy efficient or fuel efficient driving module as well. And when we did an audit very early on of compliance, we found that actually the compliance was low with the safety equipment being fitted. And the executive made a very important decision and they said that any lorry that got to a crossrail site that was checked and found not compliant and all would be checked would be turned away without delivering its load and there would be no compensation paid. And they did that and that happened and it was a bit painful, but it was amazing how fast that the compliance um, percentages just shot up. And a very interesting thing that happened was that in the technical press, hauliers would actually advertise themselves as crossrail compliant because that became a competitive advantage in the marketplace and a way of winning work. So that was just one particular particular story around, around the traffic and transport um, issue. But as I say, lorries didn't turn out to be the issue that, that people feared it to be, but that isn't to say that it's, it's not a key issue to be managed in terms of vulnerable road users. I'll throw this one in very briefly because the sharp amongst you will know that in that list of significant impacts and challenges I showed earlier, air quality wasn't included. The lesson learned here is that some things can go up up the, up the concern rating um, that weren't originally. And air quality in London quickly shot up the political agenda very rapidly. Now we built into our contracts the requirement that they meet um, Euro 3B standards for non-road mobile machinery, that site plant, um, or be fitted with diesel particulate filters. So, so when, when the politi politics of that got really tight, we, we looked at and we ju judged compliance on the site and we found it quite low, quite similar story to that safety equipment story. We worked with the contractors again to find out what the blockers were. Um, we realized that for some things there wasn't a lot on the market at the time, so we did a sort of a graded introduction system. So those things that could be fitted right away or could be compliant right away, we required them to get on and do that. And other things, we gave a period of grace, a year, two years, big things like crawler cranes. And there was also a derogation thing for bits of equipment um, that just couldn't be um, couldn't couldn't meet those standards. Um, there's some old piling routes that are like that. Um, or it was going to be used for an incredibly short period of time, so it wasn't an issue. So from a very low percentage, 84%, actually complied with our standards at the end of the day. Right, you'll be happy to know this is basically the last slide. Um, there is so much detail that I could have gone into. Many of you may be sitting there and saying, yes, but he didn't say how this or the detail of that. And I appreciate that absolutely. And we actually created what's called the Crossroad Learning Legacy website, which you can find here. And there's a number of themes. One of those themes is environment. And you will find case studies, best practice examples, documents, you name it, um, all about just about everything that I have gone through today. And we realized that, that knowledge is live. So whilst that is itself static and hopefully will provide you with a lot of information you might be interested to read, all the authors are identified and they are now what's called Crossroad Learning Legacy Ambassadors. They are all on LinkedIn. You can contact them and to the best that they can and recognizing they may have moved on to other jobs now, they will respond to questions on those aspects should you be interested. In terms of the final take home messages on this presentation, I would say the environmental statement was by and large a pretty good predictor of what the significant impacts and significant challenges would be. The environmental minimum requirements turned out to be an extremely effective document in terms of governing our environmental management and performance. Um, and the, the, the big learning legacy, of course, is that the people and the contractors have learned from this. And so much of that then becomes a legacy as they move on to future projects. I hope some of that was of interest to you. Sorry for going so much over time. That's gone longer than I expected. Um, but I hope that that has been of some interest to you. So thank you very much, Rob. That was really interesting and uh, also a really clear presentation. And, uh, and uh, now I would like to ask a couple of questions. Um, so let's start from Laura, who asks whether you received any complaints about construction dust. We, there were some isolated complaints, but again, actually very few. Um, dust management generally on the sites has been very good and it was at its riskiest during demolition and, and that, that's a very well-known quantity and the contractors and that were very good at managing that. And then once you got down to constructing below ground, um, it was actually more controllable perhaps than, than people at first thought. So by and large, no, dust hasn't been a big issue on any of our sites. Very few complaints indeed. 
Okay, thank you very much. And um, one more question. Did the additional measures undertaken to meet environmental targets, uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of impact did uh, these additional measures had on the uh, finances of the project? Yeah, so um, that, that, that is actually very hard to answer. The, the, in the scheme of the cost of Crossrail, the environmental management and performance um, setting of targets and, and, and achieving what we achieved was, was a tiny amount compared to the overall cost of Crossrail. It was built in early. Um, so once we got through the authorization process, we set about setting our targets as soon as possible. And, and we did, we approached it in three ways, actually. Um, if, if there were reputable um, and, and good experienced bodies out there that could assist us with, with, with information, then we would use them, hence using RAP. Um, for, for the excavating material and construction waste, which I didn't go into here. So, so there we were able to set the targets very early on, and in fact those went into the contract. Um, but then there were things where actually uh, there, there, were, there was nothing out there, and so we used um, the best experience we could using the people of the project. So there I would say take the, take the carbon ones. No, no one out there seemed to be able to say that they'd used this stuff on construction carbon before. So we worked with our contractors to work up what we thought was a decent target. Given how much we actually achieved, if I was to say there was one thing for future projects is you can set a tougher target. 8% um, was clearly you know, easy to do. And now you might be looking in fact in the future at achieving at least 18 or 20% and more if you really want to be um, adventurous. But you can imagine that, that if that was all going to cost money, um, that there would have been a lot of arguments around that. But actually it wasn't. It was deemed that as part of achieving almost the license to continue to operate and, and avoiding complaints as best you could, and you, you don't, can't avoid them all by any means, um, these, these were actually all beneficial in their own right. And I'd actually say that um, on that construction target, that 18% or so of um, carbon avoided, that's just over two million pounds we didn't spend on energy. So, so that gives you that example. So in setting the targets we did, um, I don't think there was a, an unusual cost to the project at all. Certainly, for example, Wallasey Island and the work we did there, which wasn't identified early on, but it became something we did, there was there was no greater cost than, than that which we'd already set aside as a budget for getting rid of excavated material in the first instance. Great, thank you very much. Uh, different question from Adam. Uh, did the archaeological finds end up in the Museum of London? So, so the, the, the short answer is yes. The Museum of London has, has got and, and kept all the key finds. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for one last question, I believe. Um, so uh, what, what new environmental innovations were the um, most successful? So, yeah, so I think you, I, I can answer that on a, on a number of levels, really, um, because there, there were lots of very specific innovations used, like I gave you that, that drill and burst approach, for example. Um, you'd also have to say, funnily enough, if I go back to that air quality example, when, when we realised what the pressures were to deliver on that, that, there was no real process around achieving it. And indeed, when we asked why there was a low compliance to start with, and we even went out to the, the Olympic Delivery Authority because, of course, they, they were doing a, a lot of work at the time, show in 2012, um, and they hadn't achieved that either. And, and in fact, what you found was there was this issue of um, whether there were risks to warranties by fitting diesel particulate filters, whether there were dangers of overheating on fitting them, whether equipment was available in the market. So the very process that was established, um, and, and a, a lot of credit goes to our environment, a lady named Cathy Meyer here, um, was actually just setting up the process by which we would get our contractors to a compliance. So given that we achieved 84% from a very low level, I would say that in terms of innovation, that, that that entire process was new and highly effective. And what's more, in fact, when the GLE set up its its own um, requirements around um, NRM and performance in London, um, Cathy would attend their meetings because the learning that we had was, was of use to them. So so that's, that's another example there. I, but uh, thank you very much. I think we've run out of time. So I will take these last minutes to uh, thank, er thank everyone for attending. And please do not forget to record your attendance at this webinar in the IES CPD tool. Um, so this webinar will be made available on the IES website as well as on the IES uh, YouTube channel.
So do follow this channel by subscribing so that you can be notified every time that a new webinar is added. And I would also like to invite all the attendees to register for our next webinar, which will be presented by Seamus Lefroy Brooks on the 6th of February, so just next week. And this webinar will look into the National Quality Mark Scheme uh, for Land Condition Management, so really interesting. You can register for this on the IAS website, so uh, please do so. And so thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and we hope you enjoy the topic. And also thank you very much, Rob. Oh, pleasure. Thank you.